I was saying before in the introductory comments that transfer pricing is about value. And you've got to constantly keep this in mind that, of course, there are rules, you know, there are regulations, they go on for hundreds of pages. But they are pretty much all about value. They're not about the usual kinds of tax law analysis that we do. So your attention and your understanding has got to be focused on this value and on, as I say, functions, risks, and assets. And you've got to train yourself to focus at these things in order to be a good uh, tax professional. Because this is very much at the heart of international tax planning, and for that matter, domestic planning as well, because in the domestic context, you've got to worry about state taxes. This can make a, uh, a difference for state tax purposes as well. Okay, so what are some fundamental points that should be made? Well, first one is to remember that taxation is an entity by entity issue. Yes, we do see a lot of consolidated tax returns in the United States. A lot of companies use that mechanism. There's even a, you know, some number of other countries that have some sort of consolidated or group relief filings. But for the most part, if you are working and focusing on a US-based multinational, the foreign subsidiaries are separate entities. They do not consolidate for tax purposes. Consolidation for financial purposes does not count. Your analysis is company by company. And pricing is company by company. Now, I think I've mentioned as an example before that if you talk to somebody who works for General Motors, and say, who do you work for? He's going to say, gee, I work for General Motors, or maybe I work for the, uh, uh, the Buick division, or uh, whatever. But he's not going to focus on which company, which specific entity he works for. When we look at transfer pricing, this makes a difference. Which company is involved? What is each company that's a party to a transaction doing? Again, going back to those functions, risks, and uh, assets. Our analysis is an economic analysis focused at different legal entities and the transactions they conduct amongst themselves. So very, very basic uh, concept that needs to be part of your understanding of the environment in which we are operating. By its very nature, trans uh, controlled transactions, as they're called, are between two members of a group to, that are commonly controlled. And if the transfer pricing is not right, then the profits of one company are overstated and the profits of the other are understated. Now, of course, it could also be that uh, the losses are overstated and the losses are understated. So it's, it's either profits or losses, but it's a zero-sum situation there is among several companies let's say that are related there's a certain amount of profit and that profit in total is going to be whatever it is let's say a hundred but what's the right answer is it 60 in one and 40 in the other is it 55 and 45 is it 40 and 60 what is it and this makes can make a tremendous amount of difference. Why? If one company is a US company and the other company is a uh, foreign subsidiary which is conducting operations which are not, let's say, caught by the subpart F rules, if you're overstating the income of that foreign subsidiary, that creates additional income in a CFC which either ultimately doesn't get taxed at all under the Section 245A dividend received deduction, or alternatively is subject to tax on guilty, 
at a reduced rate. And of course, if a foreign group member is not itself a CFC, then it will escape U.S. taxation completely. In summary, it's very important to realize that within a group, if you've overstated one, you're understating somebody else. The principle expression, the arm's length principle, that's how we decide what is the proper amount of income in each of the controlled entities when they have transactions between them. The heart of this is if the results of the transaction are consistent with the results that would have been realized if uncontrolled taxpayers had engaged in the same transaction under the same circumstances. This is your arm's length standard. If you had two uncontrolled parties, what would they do in the same situation? Now, that really sounds good, makes good sense. You know, gee, we're looking at real economic activity between two unrelated parties and we're using that as the basis for our controlled transaction between two related parties. Sounds really wonderful, but how often in real life is there in fact an uncontrolled transaction doing exactly what we're doing? Yeah, it does happen, but there are a lot of situations where it doesn't. As a result, the arm's length standard has come under some amount of attack, but despite that, it is still the accepted format. Yes, it's still the accepted format today as it was in 2011 when this lecture was recorded. However, as of early 2020, that attack is continuing within the OECD's inclusive framework and its base erosion and profit shifting project. The inclusive framework is considering ignoring the arm's length standard to a limited extent in order to assure market countries that are not otherwise able to tax income under the current system of some limited amount of income to tax. And there's continuing pressure from some uh, some countries for digital service taxes based on gross receipts or unitary taxation that would apportion group income based on factors such as sales, personnel, and assets. Uh, you find uh, in the regulations, you find definitions of control and controlled taxpayer and uncontrolled taxpayer and also controlled transaction, which is on the next slide. Notice the definition of control. It's very, very broad and is not focused at legal form. It's focused at, gee, does somebody have effective control? irrespective of, you know, is there the legal mechanism to force it. Say you're the supplier of another company and you can effectively put that other company out of business because you're the only supplier. Is that control? Well, it might be in some cases, but the point is there can be more than just share ownership. Interlocking directors, uh, <coughs> directors being uh, uh, directors for more than one company might be a, uh, uh, a situation or common employees or management personnel be another, another area. Now there's some very, very, I think, useful discussion you know, you read through it and it, uh, it sort of maybe feels like, uh, like, motherhood, like motherhood as you read through it. You know, you sort of say, well, gee, isn't this obvious? But uh, it's, it's laid out uh, in order to make clear the fact that you really need to 
examine the details of what the parties are doing to know whether something's comparable or not. And why is comparability important? Well, again, remember I said that the standard is an arm's length price. You can only use a particular uncontrolled transaction, in other words, a transaction between unrelated parties. You can only use that to have a basis for the pricing of your own transaction if there's comparability, if you know they are sufficiently similar to be able to use one as the basis for the other. Uh, in uh, 482-1, you have a lot of discussion of these things. We'll talk a little bit about several of them. And then in some of these specific methods for different types of income, for example, services or uh, intangibles or what have you, then there's further guidance in addition that is specific to that type of income or type of transaction. You sometimes hear this reference to a functional analysis. Oh, gee, what's that? Well, let me ask a question. Have, uh, have any of you uh, done any transfer pricing work before, or have you talked with prospective employers that might be thinking of you for uh, a transfer pricing position? Hey, Ben, uh, now, is that, is that to say that you, you have some background, or you... Uh, uh, have had a job interview, or you know, what does that have to say? Some former experience. Okay, and what sort of things did you do when you were out there actually practicing? Well, in regards to the functional analysis. Yeah, it's a good start. Well, you go to what would happen is that we would go and interview key personnel at at the company to figure out what they do, because what they and then try to figure out like hold functions, risks, and assets, like what functions they do, what risks do they undertake, what assets do they employ. Um, and in doing that, you can try to understand their business on the economic side. Like, because they have a, they oftentimes have a different idea of what they do, and we kind of have to parse out what they're saying and how we can apply it to the, you know, to do a comparability study. Yeah, now notice what, uh, what Ben has said. He had to sit down with operating people and talk about what they did. He's not just going and talking to somebody in the tax department. He's going and talking to operating personnel, whether high management, middle management, or the, you know, the guy on the floor to see what he's doing. This is a totally fact-based situation. And you only find out through a lot of effort. Now, did you ever uh, find out how much they charged for your services for doing uh, a project like this? Yeah. <laughs> Scary, huh? Yeah, but it saves the money, hopefully. <laughs> it, it saves the money. Well, hopefully it keeps them out of trouble, yeah. that's true. May or may not save the money, because in the absence of your work, they might have been more aggressive. But the point is, it can easily cost $100,000 to do a transfer pricing study. Why? Because you have to send a team of people like Ben out there to spend hours and hours trying to figure out what the company is doing. And not only this company, but each company that's involved somehow in these controlled transactions. Now, did you just keep that in your mind, or did you actually put it down on paper what your findings were? Yeah, definitely. It's part of the, what we, the documentation that we normally provide for their um, contemporaries or planning documentation. Now, how many pages was this uh, was this uh, missive that you put together for them? Depends. I mean, um, it depends on the company and like, the different type of divisions that they may have, but and kind of like what we're testing. But it, it could go on for <coughs> pages and pages. Does that mean uh, five or six, or does that mean 105 or 106? Nothing. I haven't ever written one that was 100 pages, but... Yeah, well, I've seen yeah. some number of them that have yeah. been, yes. Uh, the point is that this is a fact-based detailed effort. 
Uh, I sometimes think that firms charge by the pound uh, you know, for, for these studies. But having said that, uh, you uh, then referred to something else, which was you know, contemporaneous documentation. The point is that if a tax authority comes in and says, well, gee, uh, we would like to know what you did regarding your transfer pricing, uh, if you don't have some sort of economic analysis as to what each company did, what assets it has, what risks it took, then you know how can you talk intelligently to somebody else about why this was economically the right answer? Uh, these transfer pricing studies are really economic analyses of what the parties are doing. And they take a lot of effort, a lot of effort. Uh, at the heart of it is a functional analysis of what are the people doing? What happens within the box of each legal entity? The expenses that, are, that that entity incurs to do certain things, what are they? Who's bearing, you know, which entity is bearing the cost of each function? Because these are economically things that can be identified and through con contract terms, which we'll get to in a moment, can be economically borne by any company that you choose to, uh, to do this, you know, to, uh, to bear it through contract terms. Uh, I love this listing. Actually, it goes on for uh, two slides. Uh, I pulled this listing out of a, uh, a BNA portfolio uh, appendix on transfer pricing. The point is that contract terms are obviously at the heart of who bears expenses, who you know, accepts risk. When we look at transactions that are between related parties, typically those transactions are, of course, evidenced by agreements. If you have a sale of property, well, maybe there's a, uh, a contract of sale. If it's a regular sale of inventory that occurs you know, quite often, maybe there's a distribution agreement. Maybe there's you know, one company is the manufacturing company, one company is the uh, uh, distribution company, so that the one sells to the other and the other sells to unrelated parties. Let's say there's a distribution agreement between the two. If we have two related parties that want to have a distribution agreement, what flexibility do they have with regard to what terms they put into that distribution agreement? What do you think, uh, Mark? Um, I mean, they, they have unlimited options, it seems. I mean, they, they have to look out for something like this, but it seems in general yeah, that's exactly right. Two parties who are not dealing at arm's length because they're commonly controlled, two parties can write whatever they want and they can have a legally enforceable agreement with those terms. And in addition to being legally enforceable, if they in fact uh, take their agreement seriously and uh, act in accordance with that agreement, generally courts and tax authorities respect those agreements and take them seriously. Even though the two parties, uh, so to speak, uh, uh, may have uh, you know, had a laughing fit at the time that they were coming up with the terms because the terms were uh, you know, obviously helping achieve a certain tax goal. All of these kinds of things, totally at the, cho let's say, the choice of the control parties. Now, let's just look at a few of these and think about a few of these that represent, uh, let's say, issues of economic risk. In other words, which party bears economic risk? Okay, volume volatility. Any idea what that means? Well, it sort of means, you know, what happens if, uh, the uh, quantum of sales, for example, 
is at one level or another level. And for example, let's say in, in a, an agreement between unrelated parties, maybe there could be certain minimum agreed purchase amounts because maybe the seller says, gee, uh, you know, you're requiring me to, uh, to uh, invest in certain new machinery. Uh, yeah, I want to make sure that I'll have enough quantity of production to you know, not have a big loss because of having bought this new machinery. So the parties who are unrelated might agree to some minimum level of purchasing. Now, in a related party situation, you can totally ignore that, even though economically there's that issue there. Or even if the economic issue isn't there, you could write it into a contract. Return privileges. You know, who economically takes the risk of customer returns? That's something which is totally controllable by contract between two related parties. Now, what do these differences mean? If we put more risk on one party, so for example, let's say the manufacturer agrees to accept any return. Let's say the manufacturer agrees to bear the cost of all advertising. What effect might that have on the relative price of the product which the manufacturer is selling to the distributor? Yeah, the price should go up to the extent that the manufacturer is bearing certain costs, accepting certain risks. The price, relatively speaking, should go up. This is something that, in a sense, by defining within the contract these various terms in one direction or another, you can push the arm's length price higher or lower, depending on what your goal is. You may have heard the term limited risk distributor. Well, what's a limited risk distributor? Well, gee, maybe it's a, you know, a distributor that is not taking the risk of bad debts, not taking credit risk on the customers, because that risk is contractually being pushed off to a, the a related company through these contract terms. Again, cost of advertising. If the distributor is not going to bear the cost of advertising in the country of the distributor, again, that's less functions. And the economic risk of spending money on advertising and will it be benefit, uh, beneficial to produce more sales, you end up affecting, of course, the relative price. So a limited risk distributor is, in a sense, emasculated by these contract terms to end up with the lowest margin possible within uh, that uh, distributor so that you minimize the amount of taxable income in that distributor. If that distributor is in a high tax country, well, gee, maybe you want to do that. So this is a, a common thing. Have contract terms that create a limited risk distributor. This is a pretty good listing of some of the things where there is an ability to decide, well, which way should we write this? And related parties, as Mark was saying, have total freedom. As long as what they're doing is, let's say, not too ridiculous from a commercial standpoint, what you do is generally respected. Risk, uh, just very briefly, we've mentioned in discussion uh, credit and collection risk product liability risk, who accepts that, market risks, success or failure of R&D activities. A lot of, uh, there's a lot of identifiable things. Once you get into the details, as Ben was trying to indicate, of an actual business. Economic conditions, if you're trying to compare, you know, an uncontrolled transaction with a controlled transaction, the economic conditions, are we talking about the same part of the world? Are we talking about transactions of similar volume? This is something that uh, uh, we could have uh, Ben probably pontificate about for a long time, but we'll, uh, we'll just say a word or two about it. And that is that uh, very often 
you of course do not find an exact transaction which is identical and therefore gives you a single a single answer and therefore what the regulations give you is a concept of a range you know after all this work that then did to go out and get the uh, you know a, a real good functional description of who's doing what and what risks each party is taking and uh, so on and so forth what assets they have after he's done all that he's got to look for comparable transactions between unrelated parties now that's a terrible uh, exercise in itself probably what brought you into this program uh, escaping from that but uh, but anyway uh, the point is that you end up finding some number of unrelated situations or at least you hope you find some number that are at least close enough that you say these give answers which maybe should influence what our price is. Now if you have five, if you identify five unrelated situations, and of course they're going to give you five different answers. Well those five different answers give you a range. And the regulations are saying, okay, you know, figure out what the range is, and then there are some rules as to how you then apply do you apply the medium of the range or some other uh, place within the range uh, yes peter um, how about for risks that are hard to identify and, and i'm thinking or quantify and i'm thinking for example if a company is is doing business in a country where there's um you know if you have to do corruption uh there's bureaucratic red tape and it's political risk Maybe the corruption payments will be easy to quantify, but as far as bureaucratic red tape and political risk, what happens there? I mean, can the U.S. government come in and say, okay, um, you, you didn't pay the company in that country enough to account for its political risk? Can, I mean, can the U.S. Can, can the service do that? I mean, well, no doubt, uh, no question. Uh, the issue of political risk uh, is a real one. What I have seen most often from a political risk standpoint is that a U.S. company that has formed a subsidiary in that country where there is political risk, they might get insurance for the value of that subsidiary or some percentage of the value of the subsidiary. Because, yeah, if there's political risk and all of a sudden you know, the thing is gone. Uh, a simple example, which fortunately turned out happily in the end. I was in Russia from 92 to 97. And 1993, let us say there was a little bit of a disagreement between different branches of the government. And the Russian White House, the Yelly Dome, uh, was, the tar was t good for target practice by the forces under Yeltsin against the, uh, the uh, shall we say, conservatives or maybe reactionaries that wanted to go back. Uh, yeah, I was there and they were trying to walk along the side of the buildings, uh, you know, hearing sniper fire, uh, you know, going to and from work for a few days. And it very well could have happened that Yeltsin didn't win and I would have eventually gotten on a plane and left. Because, yeah, maybe the country would have been closed up. Yeah, there's obviously a loss of value to the extent that a subsidiary uh, disappears because of political risk. Yeah, that can happen. It does happen. Normally, if a parent company wants to, they can get political risk insurance. And they are the ones bearing the cost for that. But normally, that's not going to affect the transfer pricing, in a sense, for product sales between the companies or other intercompany transactions. If a company in a politically difficult area has higher expenses because of the problems of doing business there, and of course, uh, uh, rather than using your expression of bribes, I'll assume it's item, you know, whatever it is, it's items which are not, you know, not problems under the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. 
which is uh, another issue. If there are higher costs and higher risks of being there, yeah, that might affect the pricing between the parties. Uh, you sometimes hear a term uh, interquartile range. Don't worry about what it is so much. Just know that if, if it ever becomes important to know what the interquartile range is because somebody is using the term and you don't know what it is, uh, you can find it uh, in the regulations. Uh, it's, uh, it's something that's referred to when you're talking about the range of possible pricing. So not so important as to exactly what it is. Just know that it's a term you might run into. If it's important, you know where to look. Uh, this next area is an important concept. Let me attempt to go through this one and the following slide uh, together. And I'll use the whiteboard since this thing uh, doesn't seem to be working. Well, for simplicity, we'll assume the usual uh, let's say U.S. parent and foreign subsidiary. And we will assume that uh, there's a simple sale of property, uh, sale of inventory from the one to the other, and then this one resells to customers. Let's assume that we have a manufacturing cost of 60, a selling price of 80, selling price, and then, let's say, uh, selling price of 120 to the customer. So our transfer price is 80, and uh, ignoring other expenses for simplicity, we have, uh, let's make this uh, 125 so the numbers aren't the same. Uh, we have a difference of uh, we have 20 over here, and here we have uh, 45. For simplicity, no expenses to uh, confuse the issue. Let's say the IRS looks at this and says, gee, 80 is too low. If 80 is too low, you have overstated the income in the foreign subsidiary. You have understated the income within the U.S. parent. 20 is too low, 45 is too high. So the IRS makes an adjustment. Now, if the IRS is making an adjustment, who are they auditing? Are they auditing the parent, the foreign subsidiary, both of them? Who is the audit on? The parent, yeah, because the parent is the U.S. taxpayer. The IRS has no jurisdiction to do anything down here because uh, this company we're assuming is number one, a foreign company. Number two, we're saying, we're assuming it has no US trader business. It's not a US taxpayer. Let's say that the IRS looks at this and says, gee, the 80 was too low it should have been, let's say, 110. If this were 110, then the 20 becomes 50. This one receives an assessment from our friendly IRS agent to pay additional tax on the 30. So 35% of the 30 higher US tax. We're, we're going to cover a couple of points in this, uh, this example. Uh, uh, first of all, what, what happens down here? Is there any adjustment down here? Well, it's not a taxpayer. So from a U.S. standpoint, no adjustment. But is earnings and profits potentially important to anybody? Yeah, at some point in the future, when this one makes a distribution, or if it has some part F income, or some other transaction where earnings and profits is important, then the amount of earnings and profits will make a difference for U.S. tax purposes. So the first point 
And this is the, the slide you remember that said uh, correlative adjustment. That's that the earnings and profits down here is appropriately adjusted. So the earnings and profits will not be uh, 45. The earnings and profits will be adjusted down to 15. So reduce the earnings and profits by the 30 of the adjustment. So there's a corresponding adjustment and the regulations make clear that the IRS has to make appropriate adjustments. If you increase one, you decrease the other. This is a zero-sum game in terms of the amount of income that gets recognized among the group members. Okay, so that's the first aspect. Uh, now, let's take the second aspect, which is not for the slide you've seen, but uh, let's, uh, let's do it in this order. Let's assume that this foreign subsidiary is in a country that, of course, has an income tax. Doesn't matter so much whether it's a high tax rate or a low tax rate, it just has an income tax. Now, what was the tax base when this foreign subsidiary prepared its tax return? What was the tax base, the taxable income, in the tax return that was prepared and filed with the country A tax authorities? What was the tax base? The unadjusted amount. Pardon? The unadjusted amount. The unadjusted amount. So the country A the tax base declared to the country a tax office was 45. Okay, now let's think about this. The U.S., uh, the IRS has adjusted the income. The IRS has said, okay, earnings and profits will be adjusted. What effect does any of this have on the amount of foreign tax which that company paid to its local country A tax office. Yep, no effect. No effect. Now, what do we find in the foreign tax credit regulations? In our U.S. foreign tax credit regulations? A to be a foreign tax, a payment must be compulsory. Does that word uh, ring any bells from uh, a few weeks ago? A payment of tax is not a tax if you, you know, gratuitously paid it and you really didn't have to. So what the regulations say is that if we have a situation like this, the foreign subsidiary must make some effort to try to get the country a tax office to reduce local country tax to reflect that pricing adjustment. Now, I would say in an awful lot of situations, uh, the local country is going to laugh at the person, you know, who comes and makes the request. Because remember, this is a separate legal entity. It has its own transactions and, you know, normally tax authorities approve them. So the fact that some other tax authority disagreed doesn't hold much water. Uh, yes, Peter? Do, do government tax authorities share information with each other about adjustments? Okay, now you're going to the next step, which is, what if country A and the United States have a tax treaty that provides not only for sharing of information, 
but more importantly, provides a, uh, a dispute resolution mechanism, which is what's normally referred to as the competent authority procedures. Yes, the taxpayers, uh, one, uh, where there's a tax treaty, uh, and if the, you know, if the amount of possible lost foreign tax credits because of this concept of voluntarily having paid extra foreign tax, uh, if there's a tax treaty in this situation because you know, the amount is large, then the parties may go through this uh, competent authority procedure in order to attempt to resolve the difference. So, yes, the companies have to make some effort and it's a bit easier, potentially uh, more, uh, you know, more uh, positive, more reliable, so to speak, if there is a treaty and there's competent authority procedures. And again, competent authority procedures are getting the two governments to talk to each other. They will either reach agreement and compromise in some way, or maybe they'll agree to disagree. The taxpayer is actually not a party to that discussion. It's between the governments. But it takes a taxpayer to initiate that discussion. Now the third point that I want to make, now notice that although there's the transfer pricing adjustment, that adjustment is only made for tax purposes. That adjustment is only for tax purposes. So how much actual earnings are here? The 45 is the amount of cash and earnings that's down there. The fact that the U.S. increases this one's income and therefore increases the amount of tax due does not change the fact that the actual invoices and other paperwork and intercompany payments for all transactions cause 45 of real earnings. That doesn't change. That's fact. Now, there's this difference economically between, or let me just say there's this difference between the 45 of real earnings and the 15 of what the IRS is saying the earnings and profits should be. Now, to go along with, uh, with this difference and to recognize that uh, there's still this much money here. There needs to be a further adjustment, a further adjustment to explain why there is that difference. Because, as I've said once or twice before, the U.S. system is consistency. I'm sorry, what's important to the U.S. law is consistency. Okay, so what do I mean by consistency? Well, we have to explain why there is 30 more at this, in this company than there should be. Well, the only way it could happen is if in the mind of the IRS, in the mind of the fictional world that we create for tax purposes, is that the U.S. parent had contributed 30 to the capital of the foreign subsidiary. The U.S. parent earned as income 50 and chose 
to take 30 and drop it down here as a contribution to capital. Now, a contribution to capital, of course, is not a deduction. It increases the basis in the investment in the subsidiary. So it allows everything to be consistent. What if things were opposite? What if we had a foreign parent and a U.S. subsidiary and we had exactly the same situation where there was 30 more of income that the IRS says should have been recognized here because of you know, sales uh, that were originally at uh, uh, 80 and what did we say, 125 uh, to the customer. If we increase this one by 30 and have this U.S. subsidiary pay additional tax on that additional 30 of income, but the reality is, of course, is that uh, because things are in the opposite direction, now there's more money than there should be up here in the foreign parent. More money than there should be uh, at the foreign parent level. Uh, is, is, is this working out the way I am? Uh, I should be uh, showing this as, let's say, uh, instead of 80, it should be, let's say, uh, 110. And the U.S. IRS is saying that the 110 is too large. The U.S. paid too much to the foreign parent. They should have paid only, uh, only 80 and thereby, uh, because of this change, we, of course, increase the U.S. subsidiary's income by 30, calculate tax on that 30, and, uh, but the foreign parent has, in fact, already paid, or let's say recognized, you know, income up here of 110 minus 60, or uh, 50. So again, we have a situation where there's too much money at the foreign parent level. There's too much money there. Now, in order to make the same type of adjustment we made here where we said, oh, there must have been a contribution to capital of 30, here, because it's going from the subsidiary to the parent, that 30 is a distribution with respect to stock. And if there's earnings and profits at this level, we now have a dividend. And gee, is there a dividend withholding tax? Yes, there is. Assuming no treaty applies 30% under 881. So there's, let's say, a primary adjustment of uh, the uh, adjustment of the earnings and profits in this, this situation. That's sort of the primary adjustment uh, because things, it's a zero sum game. And then a secondary adjustment of Okay, if there's too much money in one place or the other, we have to figure out how that money gets there within this fiction. And generally, it's going to be either a contribution to capital if it's one direction, a dividend if it's the other.